Hello, everyone. My name is Betty Cruz. I'm the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. Uh, very excited to be here with you today. I'm joined by Sonika Chak, who you'll be hearing from in a little bit, and from Ambassador Curry. Uh, she is joint Kelly Curry's uh, ambassador at large on uh, global women's issues, and she's joining us here today to have a conversation around uh, the U.S.'s role in fighting human rights abuses. We're thrilled to be hosting this event in partnership today with the Women and Girls Foundation and the City of Pittsburgh Gender Equity Commission. We encourage everyone who's joining us, whether it's via Zoom or on Facebook, to submit your questions throughout uh, our time here together, and we will be getting to those later in the program. Uh, so first, we're, I'm going to kick it over to, to Sonica in a moment, uh, and she's going to share some remarks, and then we'll hear from the ambassador, and then we'll have a plenty of time to go through questions and want this to be a nice, rich and, and robust conversation. Sonika Chalk, thank you again for being here with us. Sonika is a, a talented uh, young woman and we're so excited to have you join us. Uh, she's part of one of our partner organizations at the Women and Girls Foundation, part of GirlGov there. Uh, Sonika goes to North Allegheny Senior High School as a rising junior. As a member of GirlGov, which is a program focused on building young women advocates who fight for women and various other issues, and part of the council's youth education, which educates students about world issues and affairs and how to be more involved in working towards a solution. Sonika is obviously already a very engaged uh, community member and we're thrilled to have you uh, here today. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Sonika Chalk and I'm a part of the leadership council for GirlGov. I'm interested in global issues because as a daughter of immigrant parents, I know how a lot of other countries aren't nearly as privileged when it comes to women's rights as Americans are, and I wanna change that. So I'm really excited to hear from Ambassador Curry speak, but first we'll show a video explaining the State Department. It's a wonderful and complex world out there, filled with challenges and opportunities. That's why America's diplomats with the U.S. Department of State are on the job every day representing you. We are advancing America's foreign policy interests by uniting our allies, confronting our adversaries, in protecting our citizens. We advance democracy, human rights, global health, and more. We grow markets that create American jobs. We are America's first federal agency, and we're in 190 countries at over 270 U.S. embassies and consulates serving you. We are the United States Department of State. Okay, next, Ambassador Kelly E. Curry will be speaking. Ambassador Curry was appointed ambassador at large for global women's issues, meaning she works as an ambassador for no specific country and serves as the U.S. representative at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. Ambassador Curry specializes in human rights, political reform, development, and humanitarian issues with a focus on the Asia Pacific region. She has held positions in the Department of State, the U.S. Congress, and several international and non-governmental human rights and humanitarian organizations. So now I'll hand it over to her. Great. Oh, good. Okay. I wanted to make sure I was unmuting myself properly. It's, we're still learning how to use all this technology here at the State Department. We've had to really flex over the past few months to adjust to the new reality in our um, COVID world, our post-COVID world. So I really appreciate being able to join you all virtually here from here at the State Department, from my office, the office of the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues. And I am really pleased to be able to work with the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh and your partners, the City of Pittsburgh's Gender Equity Commission and the Women and Girl Foundation, and for their work to make this event possible. 
Pittsburgh in many ways exemplifies so much of what we value here in the United States from industry to innovation and engaging your local community as well as uh, leading globally on areas from healthcare to manufacturing. And we are really thrilled to be able to, um, to share our message and to talk about our work with the American people because it's a little bit of a misnomer that I don't, that I'm, um, I, while I'm not a representative to any one country in the world, I am a representative of our country and it is the greatest honor in the world to be able to represent our great nation on the world stage. Um, every time I'm able to do it, it gives me goosebumps to uh, sit when I used to work at the UN and I would sit behind the placard at my desk that said United States. It was always, it always gave me a thrill. I never got tired of, of being able to represent our great nation to the world. So I'm really excited to be able to also speak to you today about issues that are really close to my heart and that I've worked on for many years and, and that I am fortunate to be able to work on here at the State Department. And that is the issues of, of women, peace and security that are one of our top priorities here in our office. Um, it's also one of the department's top priorities and something that I care about personally very much. As the ambassador at large for global women's issues, I get to promote the rights and empowerment of women and girls all around the world through US foreign policy and to pull those initiatives through our foreign policy my goal, as I often tell um, people, is to get these issues into the DNA of our foreign policy so that they are, I, I, I tell my staff, I want everybody at the State Department working for us and advocating on behalf of our issues. And so even though we're a small office here at the State Department, we, I feel like we are able to punch above our weight because we are constantly trying to get everybody else here at the department working for us. And we do a pretty good job of that. So um, the, the main areas that our office does focus on, in addition to women, peace and security, are women's economic empowerment. And these two things are obviously very much interrelated. It's, it's, um, it, it's hard for women to be able to, to work and, and participate fully in the environment and their um, economy if there is not peace and security and stability in their countries. And we've also seen that when women are not allowed to fully participate in the economy or in the political and social life of their countries, that those countries are often places that fall into conflict and have um, or have instability and, and require um, US attention in ways that is not necessarily very positive. So we work to make sure that these efforts are joined up and we work across a number of cross-cutting at levels too on issues like countering violent extremism and supporting women and girls who are at risk of violent extremism um, and also supporting women's political leadership and helping to support women and girls who are targeted or potentially victims of gender-based violence. So those are the issues that we get to work on here. Um, and we get to work with some of the most amazing partners around the world that you could ever imagine. Um, we work with a lot of grassroots organizations in countries that are in crisis and conflict and where women are trying to change that dynamic. And we work with these local organizations and these remarkable women every day. So it's really um, fantastic to be able to, to um, work with these women, these leaders all around the world from Afghanistan to Yemen and engage them, help them, help their help magnify their voices and share their views on, on how we can um, how we can support them and how they can help contribute to their countries, the betterment of their countries and their societies. So it's it's really critical. One of the things that we are very conscious of here is making sure that women's voices are heard and that their, their voices and their empowerment is able to um, inform critical decisions in their own countries. Often we are um, able to help them to get a forum that they might not otherwise able, might not otherwise be able to access because we insist on hearing their voices too. 
And we've done this through a variety of means. It's everything from our International Women of Courage Awards, which annually honor um, between 10 and a dozen women who have exhibited extraordinary acts of courage in their own communities and helped to advance the cause of women's, um, women's rights or help to make some fundamental change in their society. And these women, um, we now have honored more than 144 women with this award over the past decade. And they are a powerful group of ladies who continue to work together and they're, they strengthen each other through their engagement and they help give each other ideas and support. And um, this is just one example. We also have a range of programs we don't have a lot of funding that we directly manage in our office, but we do have a range of really interesting programs that we use to help support women um, across the different uh, activities that we, or across the different contexts where we can support them. We are working, for instance, I can talk a little bit about Afghanistan, which is a country that is really important to the United States, obviously. It's a country where we're engaged in supporting inter-Afghan dialogue to help end the conflict there, because we believe very strongly that the best thing for women and girls in Afghanistan who've suffered from decades of fighting and violence and instability and, um, and terror and, and repression, the best thing for them is, is a durable, sustainable peace that they have a role in helping to shape and craft. So we have been working to support women who are participating in the negotiations, women's organizations that are developing um, initiatives, and speaking out directly ourselves about the need for all parties in the Afghan, inter-Afghan dialogue to respect the rights of women and girls and to protect the gains that have been hard fought and hard won over the past 20 years since um, the Taliban was removed from power in Afghanistan. So we have a very robust and cross-cutting suite of activities that we engage in um, on the economic side, on the political side, on training, and in, in our diplomatic engagement, both bilaterally in Afghanistan, as well as with partners and through the United Nations. We are using all of our tools on that um, in that particular context. And the same is true in, in other places, as I mentioned before, Yemen is another context where we continue to, to um, try to use all the tools at our disposal to support the women of that country as they um, help to fight the, the fight for peace. And, and that often sounds like a strange way to put it, but that's literally what they're doing every day. So we, we support them and we, and we um, help them with a whole range of activities, including honoring recently uh, an, an incredible young woman activist who helped, who has helped to rescue child soldiers in Yemen and, and has used her voice to help, um, feel, help the women in her community to develop their, um, their rights and protect their rights. So we're, we're really excited, as, as Secretary Pompeo often says, that Women around the world that women around the world do have an essential role in um, in helping us to prevent and end conflict, in um, atrocity prevention, in resolution and recovery from uh, disasters and other challenges, and in the provision of security and in fighting terrorism. We fight. One of the things that we really focus on in our office is there's a common tendency to um, base to to approach women and girls as victims or to cast them as victims of, of forces beyond their control we really are very careful to support women's voice and agency in our programming and to make sure that in our diplomatic initiatives that we are encouraging our partners to really listen to women and girls on the ground and hear their voices and we are really um pleased that we're able to help support women and girls in this way and help create space for them to, to make their voices known and heard. 
And so one of the things that we've really worked hard on, and we work especially, we work a lot with um, our regional bureau colleagues on this to make sure that when we are talking about these issues, that our workforce here at the State Department is trained to recognize ways that talk about women that give them agency and give them voice versus ways that paint them as victims. So I'll give you a good example that when we talk about sexual violence um, or gender-based violence, that we don't refer to victims. We do refer to survivors because we believe that, for instance, that is more empowering and more and, and language that recognizes that that they are um, the, the, the true nature or is closer to the nature of their experience. And we really try to um, make sure that we are listening as we develop our programs and as we develop our diplomatic engagement. So we're working across a whole, we're working, we get to work around the world. We can't solve all the problems of the world every day or um, deal with every single context that's out there all the time, every day. But we do try to focus on the areas where we feel we can make the most difference, where our engagement can have the greatest impact and where we can help um, provide that, that opening that, that women and girls, and especially in, in fragile and conflict affected states, are able to take advantage of, uh, they can take advantage of that space after we help to create it. Um, this year, we're really celebrating and marking the the 20th anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which set the framework and put on the Security Council's permanent agenda, the Women, Peace and Security um, agenda item. And we use that as our guidepost, both to measure how far we've come, which is substantial, that there, there is this whole community of practice around Women, Peace and Security, and it's global, it's local in, in countries around the world, and it's, we've had, over the past 20 years seen a generation of activists who have taken on this women, peace, and security mantle and advocates and women themselves who have driven this forward in their communities at the community level. And we've seen the results from what happens when we do provide women op meaningful opportunities to engage and participate in peace processes, in security, um, decision making, and in the whole range of issues that impact um, international peace and security. We've seen the difference. And so we, we have the results, but we know we still have a really long way to go. The United States um, in 2017 became the first country in the world, for example, to have national level legislation on women, peace and security when Congress passed and President Trump signed the 2017 Women, Peace and Security Act. And even though we're a leading country on this, we've always had plans and strategies that were developed through the administration, but we've never had national level legislation that mandated this to be part of our foreign policy and required us to have certain things in place. And so we have spent the past three years in this administration continuing to institutionalize and build the internal architecture because we can't really hope to impact our partners unless we've got our own house working in this way. So we've been um, ramping up our training for the people that you saw in that video to make sure that um, at critical posts and around the world, our diplomats are trained and skilled to engage these issues and to support women's voices. Um, we've developed additional programming opportunities and programming designs around women, peace, and security. And again, a lot of it is internal work. And we work really closely on this with the Department of Defense and our colleagues at the US Agency for International Development, both of whom have recently um, published together with us and the Department of Homeland Security, our own domestic security um, headquarters agency, to talk about women, peace, and security from, from that standpoint, as well as our, our um, public-facing international work on it. So we're working across our interagency processes with very strong support from the White House and the National Security Council on this. And it's, a, it's um, been really exciting, uh, even just this past year since I've been in this post, 
to see how we are continuing to do. Some of it sounds kind of boring, like we're working on implementation plans and we're you know, developing our metrics to see how we are doing. But this is actually how we make the difference is by, you know, if you can measure it, you can make it happen. And so we really believe that we need to, to do a more comprehensive and deeper internal job on getting, like I said, getting this into our DNA. And then we'll see the outcome on the back end as we go back out into the world with this more embedded in the internal workings of the department and in the internal workings of our national security and foreign policy apparatus at the national level. Um, we also do uh, a tremendous amount in our multilateral space. The, as I said, the, the Security Council resolution on 1325 provided that framework but it's really just been the beginning. We work through the UN, obviously, and through our membership in the Security Council, but also through regional organizations, um, through our um, membership in NATO, through our alliance structures. All of these nodes are critical to how we engage this agenda and work with um, other organizations, too, from the African Union to the OAS, to, and then we also bring in a lot of private sector and um, civil society partners into this as well. That's, the, that's another really critical aspect of this is our partnership aspect. So I would encourage everyone to go on to the State Department's website and check out our implementation plan for Women, Peace and Security. It goes through some of the guiding principles that we talked about that I talked about today, such as you know, making sure that we are empowering women's voices and agency, that we are targeting our, our um, work on those contexts where we can have the, the greatest impact and where it's most needed, and, and some of the issues such as that. So we are we're working really hard across this whole agenda and trying to get the department and our colleagues here as excited as we are about the potential for this to help continue the transformation of American diplomacy into a, a more focused and, um, and yet more diverse, but yet still focused set of tools that we can deploy to help manage conflict, help protect American interests, and help create a world that is a more peaceful, prosperous place for all women and all people. With that, I think I'll stop so that I can take some of your questions, and I'd be happy to, to do that at this time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ambassador Curry, for sharing um, such a deep perspective on your work and your vision. Um, we do have already have some, we already have some questions coming in, including from a number of girls within the GirlGov network. Uh, really, youth are such an important part of our work at the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh and where we're going, we're leaning more into that and really celebrating youth leadership. Uh, and you obviously spoke to that already. So we wanna uh, raise some of the, the questions uh, from GirlGov as well as uh, turn to our audience. We already have questions coming in there as well. So if you're joining us, via Zoom, uh, please put your questions in the chat. And if you're on Facebook, please add those to the comments and we'll get to as many of those as possible. We have about 30 minutes left for this uh, conversation. So I'm gonna start with one of the questions uh, from a young woman from GirlGov. She asked, you know, due to the pandemic, the educational gap and the lack of internet services are affecting many women and girls who live in vulnerable places. What are the plans that will be carried out to reduce this in inequity? This is a great question. What the pandemic has exposed um, is that these, these challenges that were there before, it's, it's both highlighted the nature of them and, and made them more visible in a way, and also in, in some cases worsen them. We have seen that women and girls have faced a disproportionate impact, um, especially when it comes to gender-based violence, as well as um, economically, with, because often women and girls are the, are the first, and educationally with girls, but women in particular are often the hardest and first hit when jobs are lost, when markets close down, when there are restrictions on, on trade or movement, that these, these will fall disproportionately on women. And, they, and women are also still having to do, carry the same care burden loads, 
that they were carrying before, or in some, in many cases, even greater uh, loads when it comes to the care economy, which is one that we've been, this has really become a huge topic of conversation across both the developed and the developing world because nobody seems to have figured out the solution here. And I think that one of the things that we have really, um, really tried to do with our own initiatives, we, there have been a number of things that the administration has done with our assistance. You know, obviously we've focused a lot of our assistance on frontline issues to deal with the public health crisis from, from this pandemic. And, um, but we are also working really hard to pivot our existing engagements to make sure that they are responsive to the current situation. The digital divide is obviously a huge issue. Um, it became, it's become even more problematic for especially as schooling has moved online and other issues. And I mean, just day to day in my own work, as I, as you know, as we try to maintain our contacts with our partners in countries where the internet has has become much much more strained or weaker and is is facing greater greater challenges, we see it firsthand in our work every day as well. So we're very cognizant of it. Um, it's going to require a lot because there's there are a lot of infrastructure issues that go along with this. It's, it's going to require long-term solutions. In the meantime, we're working with a lot of technology companies as part of our initiatives, including um, with our Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative. We are working with Microsoft, with MasterCard to help make sure that, um, that online banking services, that other critical services are available to women entrepreneurs to, um, and to, to the participants in our programs. We are also, you know, this is, this is absolutely, you know, it's, it's going to require a lot of, like I said, diverse interventions from across the, the range. But we're, we're very focused on how we can help support. We also want to make sure, as part of our Women's Global Development and Prosperity Initiative, one of the key things that we're doing is on reskilling and making sure that women and girls have the skills and training to prepare for the changes in the economy as they continue to evolve. This is critical. And often women and girls, and that women and girls are able to work in um, all sectors of the economy and, and have access to the same opportunities to work in all sectors of the economy. We know that um, in developing countries, they can do this. We've seen in some developing countries where they have higher rates of women and girls participating in STEM fields than we do here in the United States. But it's a matter of prioritizing those things and, and making sure that the interventions are put in place. So it's a long term, it's both long term and short term. I think, you know, in the short term, it's going to continue to dog us and be a real challenge for, for women and girls. And it's something we need to address as much as we can in the short term, but we need to also be working across the arc of it. And I think that the level of awareness around it has been a huge help as, as countries um, and the private sector and others start to try to drive forward solutions with technology and innovation. Great, thank you for that thoughtful reply. And that question came from Sarah, a 16 year old uh, rising junior. Our next question comes from um, an audience member, uh, Frank, who says that he feels uh, US foreign policy, America first, should be based on Martin Luther King, that an injustice to anyone anywhere is an injustice to everyone everywhere. Yet on the other extreme, Frank says, we cannot be involved in endless ethnic conflicts it's like Sunni and Shia in the Middle East. Um, he notes this is his own doctrine, uh, but inspired by Carolyn Glick and was curious about your thoughts. He adds a follow-up that I'll, I'll just say now, which is um, how can we elevate U.S. foreign policy to a higher moral plane without getting bogged down in endless wars? Well, that is really, in a sense, the question that bedevils, that has bedeviled America since its founding. And, you know, 
you can go back to the words of our founding, um, our first president, George Washington, where he talks about beware of foreign entanglements, but he also describes America as a light among nations. And so this is a, a tension that has existed since the beginning of our republic, because we are a republic founded on ideas, not on um, a single ethnic or religious or racial um, group. This is a country that was based on an idea at the end of the day, and that we're always ourselves trying to create a more perfect union. That's part of what we believe the American experiment is about, knowing that we don't have it right and that we don't always get it right, but that we are on, on our, in our own ways trying to, to improve ourselves, self-correct, and, and strive toward the realization of these very, very high aspirations about, you know, that all, all of us are equal. All of us have the same inherent dignity as human beings, that we all have a set of rights and um, that, that, that we are born to, and, and that each of us is, is, enjoys those rights by virtue of our humanity. And the challenge of extrapolating that out into foreign policy is enormous. We, we all struggle with it every day. And, and it is, it's, the, it's a constant theme that has run through our foreign policy. And you see us you know, move along a pendulum and a spectrum from time to time. Um, I'm a human rights lawyer by training. So I tend to believe in the, um, the idea that our, our values are our interests. They are what set us apart. They are what allow us to, um, to kind of walk around the world in a way as this preponderant power with tremendous economic and political advantages that most countries would, would never dream of having and yet not threaten most people that that isn't perceived as a threat by most countries. Now, there are exceptions to that, obviously, and there are always arguments about who's threatening whom. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, our, our values are that tempering limiting principle that keeps us from behaving in a certain way. And we see this most profoundly right now in the, um, the relationship that the United States is, is working through with China and the way that China is behaving in the world today and the difference, you know, how we're managing this, um, what we call great power competition that has, has come back into, you know, this is a phrase that I remember from, from college back in the 80s. I'm dating myself, but, you know, I, I went to college in the late 80s and studied international relations and great power competition was all anybody talking about. That was the thing. But then after the, the wall fell and, and the Soviet Union collapsed, Great power competition disappeared from the, the international relations, the IR lexicon. And we've had about 30 years of no great power competition, and now it's come roaring back. But I, I tend to think that, you know, I, we do have to navigate this tension because we are a democratic society. At the end of the day, we have democratic institutions, constitutional um, parameters that we operate within. And we believe in human rights and we are, you know, we believe in those things. And so we do have to, they do inform our policies, how we balance those with more, you know, hard hitting interests on a day to day basis. That's, that's what this whole building essentially exists to do, as well as the five sided one across the, the river, um, how we balance those hard power advantages we have with the appeal of our values and our societal um, values is the, the challenge. So to the, to the point that you're making about your own roots and, and, and background um, in human rights, we've had a couple of questions that come up uh, that I'm going to share with you that are related to you know human rights at home. And I know there was a great piece about you that was written in the 20, 2019 Foreign Policy Magazine as you were being appointed uh, and talked about your, your roots and, and, and how you've advocated 
on this topic and the fact that your role as ambassador at large is a newly created role by the previous administration okay. and um well newly in in that regard not hasn't it's been around about 10 years, years now <laughs> yeah i guess i guess we're almost 90 at the world affairs council um and uh what i'm thinking newly i i'm thinking yeah in a little bit more recent history but the past administration president obama created this role and president trump has has upheld it and as it relates to your your training, your experience, your passion around human rights. I'm going to uh, join a couple of the questions that we've received from the audience, from Jessica and from Megan, asking how can women around the world truly be equal when the current administration has cut, well, cut funds for family planning? A follow-up question uh, was around how are you supporting women in America specifically, uh, particularly Black women? particularly now in the midst of violent extremism being carried out against Black communities. And um, I don't want to mince any words. Those are the questions as, as they came in and would love to hear your thoughts. Um, so on the first question, I think I just have to kind of push back a little bit on the premise. The United States remains the world's largest supporter of family planning assistance by a factor. I mean, it's not even close. And we continue to provide comprehensive and voluntary family planning to women around the world. Um, and it's one of the large, it remains one of the largest parts of US foreign, foreign assistance of, of the budget is um, voluntary family planning assistance. So the idea that we have stopped or, you know, there, what we, what this administration does not believe in and what we are bound by law not to do is not provide assistance to organizations that support or provide abortion. Um, we, this is a pro-life, an unapologetically pro-life administration. And the, the law of the land is that foreign assistance cannot be used to provide or promote abortion. Um, over time, the vigor which with, with which different administrations approach that issue waxes and wanes depending on the, the views of the administration. This is a pro-life administration. We are pursuing a pro-life foreign policy. Um, and I would encourage anybody who does want to understand it to look at the policy of the, um, on protecting life and global public health that, we have, that the USAID has published on their website. And that has all of the information about it. We do not, and I will, I can tell you from my own conversations with UNFPA, the UN Family Planning Administration um, Agency, uh, that, that we have had to restrict funding to UNFPA because UNFPA continues to maintain a relationship with China's coercive family planning apparatus. Um, and the, the wisdom of that decision has become ever more clear in recent months as we continue to get ever more disturbing reports out of China about what is happening and what that administration is doing to curtail um, births and, and, and particularly target minority, ethnic minority and religious minority women in Western China, Uyghur minority, Kazakh, um, these, these minority women for extreme and very coercive birth control and it's this voluntary versus coercive element as well as the issue of abortion promoting and, and providing abortion that does differentiate us from some you know provider some donors around the world that in terms of how we approach our family planning assistance but we do insist that family planning assistance be voluntary first of all and in china it is often not and the un has refused to stop cooperation with the Chinese family planning um, agency and, and apparatus that is very coercive and increasingly targeting its, its very coercive, powerful coercive apparatus at an extremely vulnerable minority. So we, are, we, we don't apologize for that decision at all. Um, on the other issue, first of all, I do have to say that when I worked at the State Department during the Bush administration, this office existed. Um, it was not at the ambassadorial level. There was a senior director who said this office has actually existed since the Clinton administration in the 90s. It's been around for uh, almost 
um, I want to say almost 20 years now, um, but it's it's been around for a while, actually, just in different iterations. And we have had an ambassador at large now for, or it's been headed by an ambassador at large for about 13 years. So that's, um, and I'm proud to, to be able to continue that tradition. I know my predecessors um, and, and have great respect and admiration for them. Um, on, the, on the issue of, of domestic, um, how, how our work relates to the domestic challenges that this country is facing, well, I can talk a little bit about our own office is very diverse, obviously, and the State Department as a whole is, is very diverse. It is very important to the Secretary, and he talks about this quite a bit, that the Department accurately and, and, and um, positively reflect the diversity of the United States and how important it is that when we do go out into the world to represent this country, that, that we have a department that looks like America. And we are doing a really great job on that. Um, our workforce is 44% women, which tracks with the private sector average and is, is excellent considering the, you know, some of the challenges that, that historically this building, I mean, it hasn't been that long in the State Department since married women were not allowed to serve in the Foreign Service because they, you know, it, there, it was, there was a strict prohibition on married women serving in the Foreign Service, and it has not been that long since that was the case. And so we started from a, you know, deficit position, but we're working really hard to, um, on, on diversity and inclusion in this department. The secretary has been a great leader on this, as well as the other senior leadership in the department. And we have a team both at the department level, as well as within our own office that works on diversity and inclusion to make sure that we are um, recognizing the challenges that our workforce faces, that, um, that there are these historic inequities that do play out day to day in our work. I think that for us though, the key is that as we do go out in the world, and we are you know, America's face to the world in, in many ways, but as we do that, we're, we're clear that yes, the United States has problems. There's no question. We are, and, and we have this horrible birth defect of, of slavery and, and that when our nation was founded that all men created equal didn't mean me, certainly it says it right there, and it didn't mean people of color. Um, it, but now it does. And you know we've made progress. That's the key for me is to make sure that we are pushing forward and that we're always moving forward on that trajectory toward that more perfect union, toward that realization of those aspirations that we have set for ourselves. But do we fall short? Absolutely, unquestionably. But if the key is that we are working toward them and that those are the goals that we've set for ourselves as a nation. And, and as individuals and as representatives of the American people. Great, thanks for that. And leaning in a bit more into the, the, the gender bias, for lack of a better word, of what you were, you were describing and what women were allowed or not allowed to do up, up until not too long ago. We have a couple of questions that I wanna combine. One is from, from a high school student from GirlGov who asks about the pandemic specifically and the issue of domestic violence. So during the pandemic, many women are suffering from domestic abuse have and have lost their jobs ended up totally dependent on their current partner which in many cases does not allow them to leave their home um, so uh, she's curious as to what measures can be taken to reinforce the confrontation against violence and help these women who have been left without the possibility of financial support we know that this isn't a, a u.s only issue but it is something that is very real and happening right now here this the parallel question that we've also received is around femicide um, could, could you add to what your agency and the administration has done to combat femicide? 14 of the top 25 countries with the highest femicide rates are in Latin America alone. Have you worked to combat uh, this issue in the area? I know these are too big but related, so I wanted to bring them together. Those are big questions, and, and so I, I'm going to try to handle them at a couple of different levels. On domestic violence, I know that I mean, for our office, again, we're a small office with a small um, assistance budget, but the first thing that we did was request additional funding to plus up our global um, violence, Voices Against Violence program that works at the grassroots level in communities around the world to help 
support victims of gender-based and domestic violence. So we took action that was literally, and we got, the, and the, um, the funding, it usually takes us a really long time to move money in this building and in the US government, but we were able to deploy resources and plus up our resources in that regard very quickly for us, um, really fast. And so we've taken this very seriously from our, our specific offices level. It is a constant conversation with our with our partners, with our diplomatic partners. Every every conversation I have, this comes up because every country is struggling with it. At the same time, and while we do not, we absolutely don't, you know, there's no question that women have been disproportionately impacted and that violence is part of it. But the other thing we are talking about it, that we're that we're working on is is a recognition that women um, are essential workers. One in three in the United States, one in three essential workers is a woman. So, and if you look back before the pandemic, job growth for women was outpacing job growth for men. And this goes across all racial um, groups and, and all ethnic groups. Women were getting jobs at higher levels, getting and, and increasing um, their economic, their, their salaries were going up at higher levels. So um, while there is this, and, and again, I know it's real, but there's also the, the opposite thing happening where men, are, men have also lost their jobs and women are still working. And so there have been some, I don't wanna call them silver linings because I think that radically um, misstates what's going on here. But there have had to be some really critical shifts going on in households across the world where, you know, the, the um, female partner still has a job, is out working, is an essential worker, and the male partner is at home with the kids, taking care of the kids and the household because mom is at work on the front lines every day. So in some respects, we've also seen a real flip in that narrative. And I think we have to recognize that as part of this too, and see that as you know as something that that helps us to to come forward with better solutions as we start to get back into a more normal um, situation. And hopefully, hopefully, some of the changes that have come about as a result of that will be more durable as well, and and that they'll allow us to address some of the longstanding inequalities that we've been dealing with. Um, as far as the, the femicide issue, it is definitely something that we are seized with, especially in, in Latin America and in other countries. Um, and we see this as, you know, one of the things that we've been doing to, to address this is to make sure that women are able to take better control of their own destinies. And that when I, what I mean by that is, for instance, I'll give you a great example. We have a program that we work on in Guatemala and it's called um, Advancing Women Entrepreneurs. And it's a training program that we train cohorts of Guatemalan women um, it, through this wonderful module that is in Spanish. It was developed by Thunderbird um, the School of Business and and with a, a strong support from Freeport McMoran, a, a private sector mining company. And they developed this incredible training module to help female entrepreneurs uh, to create, build, and scale their, their small businesses and to create economic security for themselves so that they are able to um, provide for their own families. They're able, they don't have to migrate and put themselves at risk um, from, from leaving and they can move to a safer, better neighborhood. So we are really looking at this in a, in, in a holistic way that, that if we can help women to get more control over their own lives, over their own livelihoods and build, build a business, um, help develop, help, you know, bring that the, the safety and security into their communities that comes from having that prosperity as, as an anchor, then it, it Im improves their safety in a really critical way. So we, at the same time, we continue to work on the kind of more, I would say traditional women peace and security issues of making sure that women's voices are heard and that they are able to participate politically. These engagements 
are having an impact. And we got a we got a um, a message from our, our cable and our a cable from our embassy in Guatemala talking about how they've seen directly the impact of this program in terms of the cohorts of women who have been through it, how they're employing other women, how it's kept them from having to migrate and take their children and themselves on a risky journey to the United States, put themselves at the at the mercy of human traffickers and 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 be at the mercy of local um local gangs that extort and and, and extract money or or from violent partners and they've seen the impact that this is having and we are you know we're pushing this out across the across the kind of across um the region it's one of our most popular countries there's tremendous demand for it from other countries to get to roll this program out there because they see the positive impact we're getting it translated into other languages so that it can we can bring it into other regions but it's just the kind of thing where it it may not sound like a direct answer to the question but when you do give women power economically and um and, and able to control their lives then you help help them to become more safe and more able to um to to guard against the, the factors that put them in vulnerable positions in the first place right um ambassador that also ties in as you were saying to why some folks turn into why we have um crisis around refugees, why some folks are forced to flee um, for a variety of, of reasons that are, are connected to some of what, what you just shared in your response. This is another question that we received that ties to this. Uh, so really taking that example that you shared from, from Guatemala, um, Felicia asks, she says, I imagine working with many grassroots organizations in numerous countries to uplift women and girls globally is one of the main focus of your department. What has been your department's policy on the resettling of women and girls that are fleeing persecution, assault, exploitation, war, and instability, uh, especially in the intense political climate where many governments are unfortunately closing their doors? Um, can you speak more to that? Um, I, we have a whole bureau here at the State Department that deals with re um, refugee issues, and they are the, the lead in the department on that. We work very closely with them. Um, and you, if you look across the, the challenges around the world where we have large numbers of refugees and IDPs in different contexts, Syria, Yemen, um, from, from Burma into Bangladesh and surrounding countries, places like the, all across Africa and the Great Lakes region and the Sahel, these are, these are places where you have a lot of different factors that are pushing migration um, but when we are talking about people who are fleeing conflict or who are fleeing persecution, um, there, there, are, there are special considerations that do come into play. The United States remains one of the most generous um, countries for resettlement of refugees in, in the world. And you, we, but this year, we are not going to meet our refugee quota because of the COVID crisis. And because we, and, and it's just, um, we haven't had the number of applications even to, to, to be able to process for the, this purpose, as I understand it. That's, that was the latest thing that I heard. Again, I'm not up to, I don't have all the latest information, but I did hear that for our refugee quota for this year, we are going to fall short. Um, and it's, it's on the demand side which is, which is unusual, but this is an unusual year. We continue to adhere to our responsibilities under the, on, under the Convention on Refugees and um, that we continue to recognize that people who are fleeing persecution have, um, that we have a, a right to, to, or that we have an obligation to provide safety um, most most refugees, however, are not. They don't make it to the United States as their country of first refuge, right? They're usually um, found in countries surrounding a conflict zone. So we end up with, you know, refugee resettlement is actually a very limited. Um, in the end of the day, it's a very limited pool of. of of individuals coming into the United States and always, always has been, frankly, because our, our, our location, our geography away from most conflict zones 
in a sense, protects us from having large refugee flows. What we do have is other immigration and other migration challenges, but those are those are the, the purview of other departments here in the in the U.S. government. So I'm gonna yeah. I'm not going to get into their uh, lane on this. Yeah. I see that we're also running out of time. So we are running out of time, and we have uh, to to bring us to to a close. We have a, a couple of other. We didn't get to every question. We have a very engaged audience with many questions and we'll do our, our best to, to follow up. Um, but with with the, the few minutes that we have, there have, ha, you've touched on leadership just now and we have received a couple of questions around leadership as well as um, engagement. So I wanna, I wanna end with the point of like, what can we do? What can folks who are listening in today, young people who are listening in today with their schools um, and other ways that they're involved. But before we get there, if we can just take a step back and, and this conversation around leadership. Um, with COVID-19, there have been uh, conversations around how countries and cities led by women have handled the pandemic better than those led by men. Um, this assessment relates to a larger conversation about the importance of promoting women's leadership in civic and political spheres. Again, you've, you've, you've already spoken to that in different ways. Uh, but when you think about that and, and your own vision and your own body of work, what, what is your vision for women in government and what is something that we can all do as individuals to reach this vision or goal? Well, you know, for me, I never really set out to end up here. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> I think that for me, I, I feel like I've, I've been able to do work that I love that has meaning for me and that I... I feel that it that has, has pretty much defined the decisions I've made and the choices I've made. I also have, you know, I, I think that when you are able to take advantage of those opportunities, you have to be, have to be prepared to, to grab them. And I've been really fortunate. I have, an, I have a wonderful partner and my husband who has been incredibly supportive. And I think that's, you know, it, it, it's not something that people always talk about, but it's so critical that you make the right choices about who you choose to spend your life with and, and, and that, that person is going to support you and allow you this, to have the, the, the space to do this thing. So that's, that's been really important for me. Um, I think also, having being a being a strong role model for my own daughter and my own son and raising uh, raising um, good humans uh, with both of them is is really important to me right now I think that you all are very fortunate to be living in a time where you have no shortage of incredible female role models around the world and at home who can help you to, to chart a, a, a course forward. Um, that has not always been the case. And you are living in an amazing time where every possible door is open to you. And again, that is, and I think recognizing that there are, that the opportunities are there and, and just going for them is a big piece of it instead of, you know, I think that there's a tendency to focus on what's not being done instead of looking at how, you know, and, and letting that hold people back. I think sometimes that, that I know that that's been my, in the, at, at times I've, you know, I've fallen back on that and, and that's kind of a crutch and it's easy to say, oh, I'm not doing this or I can't do this because some, something out there is stopping me. But this is a time where for women and girls, and girls in particular, and young women in particular, there's really nothing stopping you at this point. You live in a great, we live in an, an amazing time where you have such incredible opportunities to do anything and incredible um, women who have who cut the cut the path for you to, to follow in. And so I would just, just take those opportunities. Fantastic. I think you covered the point there of what our youth can do as well and really appreciate your time today, Ambassador Curry, and appreciate the rich conver uh, conversation that we've had as well as uh, the fact that this was guided by our audience. And there was many more questions we didn't get to, but we are going to be following up with everyone 
Uh, we encourage you to complete the survey that we're dropping in the chat and on Facebook. And in our follow-up, we'll uh, connect with the ambassador's team as well. If there's other uh, questions that they can elaborate on and any other resources we can point you to, we'll be sure to do so. Again, thank you so much, Ambassador, for your time today. And thank you all for joining us. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.